Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the second installment of FibX uh, new virtual book talk series. I'm slowly watching the attendees list grow here. Welcome. Um, I'm Kevin Wisniewski. I'm the director of book history and digital initiatives at the American Antiquarian Society, uh, and I'll be the host for this program. Uh, I'm also joined by my colleague and AAS library assistant, Amanda Kondik. Um, she's uh, been a big supporter and uh, she's uh, in the background making sure everything goes uh, smoothly there. So thank you, Amanda. Uh, before we get started, I would like to thank um, both those uh, returning, uh, returning attendees uh, and AAS members and friends who continue to show me uh, your support. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to welcome all of the newcomers here uh, and uh, briefly introduce the society. Um, the American Antiquarian Society was founded in 1812 by printer Isaiah Thomas. Uh, we are currently a research library and learn society located in Worcester. Uh, and today's event is part of the program in the history of the book in American culture, uh, what we like to call FIBAC which was founded in 1983, uh, and it's part of a new monthly series. Uh, each month, we will invite an author of a recently published monograph or digital equivalent uh, to share that work, and at the end, to answer a few questions uh, from those in the audience. Uh, before I introduce uh, today's guest, I would like to uh, give a quick overview of uh, the platform. We are currently using uh, Zoom webinar. Uh, most of us uh, are familiar with Zoom at this point, uh, but there are a couple of functions I would like to uh, highlight for everybody. Uh, first, at the bottom of the menu bar, you'll see a chat function. This is where uh, I will share a few helpful uh, links. You'll see there's two up there already, uh, one to the American Antiquarians virtual programs list online, uh, and then the other is to the FIBAC mailing list where you can uh, sign up uh, and uh, keep in touch and find out about future programs. Uh, the second option, um, which you are certainly, these are not in view. I will share them again, Caroline, thank you. Um, uh, in addition to uh, the chat function, which you are more than welcome to use, there is a Q&A function. Um, all uh, questions uh, uh, that arise uh, throughout the talk, uh, I would recommend that you submit there. Um, that is the uh, space where I'll be kind of checking uh, on questions uh, for, the, for the end of the talk. Um, there's also a feature in that Q&A feature where uh, attendees can vote up particular questions. So if you see a question that you would like to see answered uh, by Glenda, um, please vote that up, and that will be uh, the first on the list. Um, finally, I would like to let everyone know that this event is being recorded. Uh, for those who could not attend, uh, the video will be made available in a few weeks via the Society's YouTube channel. So, uh, with that, um, I would like to introduce today's guest. And Glenda will be joining me in a second. There she is. Um, Glenda Goodman is assistant professor of music at the University of Pennsylvania. She works on the history of early American music. Uh, her first book, which she is uh, presenting on today, Cultivated by Hand, Amateur Musicians in the Early American Republic, uh, which was published by Oxford University Press this year, is a material and social history of amateurism. She is currently working on a new book on sacred music and colonial encounter in 18th century New England. Uh, her articles have appeared in several musicology and history journals, and she is currently working on a collaborative project, American Contact, Intercultural Encounter, and the History of the Book, which will result in a volume and digital project. And I will link to that project in the chat uh, in a little while as well. Uh, before moving into academia, uh, Glenda Goodman was a violist uh, who performed classical and experimental music. So we'll talk about that maybe at the end as well. Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome Glenda Goodman. So, thank you. <laughs> 
Thank you, Kevin. Can everyone hear me? I'm going to take that as a yes. Um, well, thank you to the American Antiquarian Society and to FIBEC for inviting me and hosting me to talk about my book. Um, and a special thanks to Kevin and to Amanda for making this happen technologically and to all of you for attending. Um, it's, it's remarkable uh, to see how even in the midst of everything going virtual, um, so much uh, invigorating scholarly and intellectual inquiry is still made possible thanks to platforms like Zoom, vexing though they are. Um, so, um, so I'm gonna talk today about the book that I just published um, uh, and uh, maybe in the Q&A we can talk about the meta question of publishing a book about books um, and also what it's like to publish a book in a time of, um, of a pandemic and, and you know my, my books themselves were quarantined for a while so there's sort of some uh, resonances going on uh, that we can talk about but for now I'm just going to walk you through some of the questions I ask in this project and show you some of the materials that I work with. Um, this is a book about manuscript music books, books of music copied out by hand by women and men, and, and, and men in early America um, in the late 18th and early 19th century. But when I started researching music in this time period, I didn't plan to work with manuscript music books. Um, but all of that changed when I saw one. And I saw one at the American Antiquarian Society. This is not a gimmick, it's true. I write about this encounter in my book. Um, uh, and it, it, I saw it kind of by chance because I found it in the catalog and a, and a finding aid, I believe. And I called it up and it's an item that is listed as um, simply, let's see. Um, Uh-oh, Kevin, I can't advance my, there we go, no. I can't advance my slides. Thank you. Um, I uh, called it up. It's a, an item called uh, Betsy Gaylord's Ballad and Tune Book, and you're seeing images of it here. Um, I looked, I've been looking at printed sources, um, printed music, and compared to those mass produced commercial materials, the individuality of Betsy Gaylord's handsome volume was a revelation. So much effort, so much care, there were mistakes, frustrations, preferences, pleasures, all contained in this book. And for reasons I didn't fully comprehend at the time, but which I'll return to at the end of this uh, presentation, seeing this book really captured my imagination and it struck me personally. Hundreds of amateur musicians copied music into blank books in early America, and I've identified about 250 such manuscript volumes um, created in the Northeast United States between 1750 and 1820. And I've gone and looked at about 100 of these personally, but then also there are a couple of bibliographical um, guides that were immensely helpful. Um, that I used. These books vary widely from a few leaves of hand-ruled paper flimsily sewn together to large leather-bound folios of pre-ruled paper. Some consist entirely of sacred music, like this volume of hymns, and others have secular songs and of a keyboard accompaniment or tunes for solo instruments such as violin, which you're seeing here. The level of skill varies widely as well. So some of these volumes display exquisite penmanship while others show amateurs struggles. This is my, by far my favorite picture from all of my research because I find that um, wrong, 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 wrong at the top of that page to be um, immensely relatable. So I set out to understand how these books came to be. So I wondered why people made them um, the books clearly took hours upon hours to create and printed music, though expensive, was available. And what, did, what does the effort men and women expended tell us about the musical, manual, and material labor they valued? Many people who made these books by hand were women. And how, so how does this connect to other kinds of gendered handwork? The ability to read and write music was specialized. How did they learn this? What does this tell us about the motivations behind and effects of changes in education in this era? How did women and men get the supplies to make these books? Why, what does that tell us about consumerism and notated music status as a luxury good in this period? 
Why did they choose to copy this particular repertoire? What does this tell us about taste and about their self-fashioning? And importantly, how did they share this music? What kinds of sociability and attachment did this music facilitate and how? Overall, these manuscript music books show that making music wasn't just a matter of playing an instrument or learning to sing. It also had a material component. With the phrase cultivated by hand, I attempt to capture that multifaceted quality uh, of what these people did. They made music that they could hear, but they also made music books that we can see and touch. So these manuscript music books and the people who made them allow me to show how this kind of music making helped to construct a distinct American subject in the post-revolutionary period, a person who was pious and erudite and disciplined and genteel and cosmopolitan. These are personal traits and I document how individuals cultivated them, focusing on a cast of characters, why, uh, six white women and three white men whose lives and experiences I trace throughout the book. I tell their stories as intimately as I can based on what the historical record provides and how I can creatively read and interpret it. The music books these women and men made occupied only a corner of their lives, and I try to represent the fullness of their experiences so as to not distort music's place in what, was, what were privileged but not necessarily easy existences. So the amateurs I write about represent a category of musician that has typically been overlooked by musicologists. The form of amateurism I uncover was, uh, it became increasingly gendered in the 19th century, and as you might expect, the more fully this kind of music making was associated with women, the less seriously it was taken. Recentering their musical contributions was one of my goals because it helpfully reminds us that making music for the sake of pleasure and self-fashioning matters. Pleasure and self-fashioning matter not only because it tells a nice story about music's importance to people, uh, it matters because in their behavior and their spending and earning and laboring, their beliefs and their tastes, amateurs' interests in music shaped the world around them. One of the key points of this book is that amateur music making played an important and heretofore unacknowledged role in the making of gender and of class, of nation and of race in the early American Republic. A reason I wanted this portrait on the cover of my book this portrait on the cover of my book, um, was because it depicts the aspirational self-presentation of the amateurs I wrote about, capturing a moment in a young, of a, a young woman's artful labor as she draws or copies music in front of her keyboard, her eyes placidly meeting our gaze with confidence and a touch of demureness. A hint of antiquity can be seen in that column uh, behind her, and it echoes the ampere style of her dress. The dark, the interior with its dark, rich colors and opulent textiles frames her golden hair and the gleaming whiteness of her dress and her skin. That this became the image of cultivation was not automatic. It had to be made or constructed. So I sought to uncover how this came to be. So today I want to talk about the work of reproducing, I'll, I'll leave it on, on her, um, the work of reproducing music by hand. Writing music by hand was a kind of physical labor. That's what I write about in my book. And handwriting itself was a kind of embodied technology. Focusing on this allows me to share many of the images that I couldn't uh, include in the publication. OUP was very generous and let me include lots of images, but not hundreds of images. Um, uh, I'm not showing hundreds of images today either, but uh, I could have. Um, so I'll, I'd like to briefly take you through some of these materials and then I will also introduce you to one of the amateurs who I write about in my book and I'll share an, uh, an example of the kind of music she and others like her enjoyed. So all technologies of music reproduction relied on the work of individuals and their laboring bodies. In the print and book trade, those individuals included a whole cast of characters like the type founder, the engraver, the compositor, the publisher, and the pressman as well as those who manufactured the paper and bound books. Um, and of course, as I show, it relied on the labor of copyists. Amateurs' contributions to the broader book ecology made more, became, uh, become more apparent when we understand that the connections and differences between copying by hand and other modes of uh, reproduction are telling. 
Focusing on technologies overlapping aesthetic qualities helps bring those similarities and differences into view. And moreover, when we analyze technologies mutually influencing visual traits, we can see how the visual presentation of manuscripts really mattered. Um, we think of these as documents to facilitate performance, but how they looked in and of themselves was important as well. Amateurs experimented with de the design elements that were ingrained in music reproduction technologies, and manipulating the appearance of manuscripts uh, provided these amateurs with an outlet for self-display, which reveals a kind of touching desire to make personal taste externally um, evident. And we can think of this sort of along the same lines as embroidering a sampler or, or wearing a fashionable hat. Um, by locating a small space for self-expression while remaining bound to aesthetic conventions and available material resources, amateurs exploited manuscript technology in a way that was both playful and earnest. The 18th century was indisputably an era of print saturation. Uh, the commercial print trade was robust in the early American Republic and in, in music it expanded in Philadelphia, in New York, Boston, and Baltimore, and in more provincial uh, outposts, publishers uh, farther from the coasts also procured presses and issued um, tune books. But manuscript practices persisted amid the glut of print and writing by hand was practical. Um, no technology was more portable than a pen or ink and, uh, or a quill and ink and paper. And not only was manuscript more convenient for uh, some written genres like letters and diaries, it was preferred um, and it was preferred for music as well. And I'm thinking that if, if we didn't get to see a lot of those images that I was showing of various kinds of manuscript books, I had a sort of slideshow scrolling through. Maybe we can go back and look at them um, at the end, because I think a lot of what I'm saying makes more sense if you have some of those in your in your eye. Um, so thanks to the observation of Peter Stolly Ross, I can point out that the concept of manuscript did not exist before the advent of print. So just as there can be no copy without an original, uh, it took the emergence of print to demarcate handwriting, um, also known as chirography, which is how I refer to it here, as a distinct mode of inscription. The two most common ways to print music before the 19th century were typography and engraving, and they were distinct from each other and from handwriting or chirography. For typographic music printing, individual pieces of type depicting single notes were set into forms and pressed into the paper. Um, here's a, a image uh, from 1770 of uh, that's Gutenberg holding a piece of type, not the inventor of movable type, but credited as such in the 18th century. So you can see a little piece of type. And then this is a specimen, uh, this is a, a, a page from a specimen catalog um, from Kazan and Company, which made a lot of the type that was used in colonial and early national America, uh, United States. Um, and so this is meant to showcase the different kinds of type you could buy if you were a music publisher. Um, the other kind of printing, uh, intaglio engraving, uh, was different. Uh, for that, an entire piece, a uh, page of music was carved onto the surface of a copper plate. And it had these beautiful, smooth, continuous lines and left telltale impressions on the edge of um, paper. And I've, I've said this in talks before, but if you, if you do a YouTube search for music engraving, it has still been happening in the 20th century and it's very sad work at Transpire. So this is an example of um, engraved music and you can, you can see the um, uh, mark of the plate around the edge of each page. That's where the whole plate was pressed into the paper. By the late 18th century, we can see the influence of print culture on manuscript copyists. This is a page from Lucy Sheldon, one of her uh, manuscript books. She's a woman I write about in the book, and she lived in Litchfield, Connecticut. She experimented with various styles of print-inspired handwriting, at times imitating the Roman and Italic script, as well as the regular spacing, clear bracketing, and carefully differentiated um, grace notes found in printed sheet music. This is what she did in this song, O, o Sing Sweet Bird, um, uh, which is by an English composer, Joseph uh, Mazzinghi. She, uh, she puts his name in the corner there. And this is part of a broader, this kind of depiction of music uh, and handwriting is part of a broader trend. Lots of copyists began to follow the conventions of print in their manuscript books. 
We can see this, for example, with the title page of this uh, volume copied by Jonathan Shipley Kopp, another of the characters in my book, um, also from Connecticut. You can see he made it, he didn't need to, but he made a title page where he titles this book, A Collection of Music in two volumes. This is volume one, which was full of sacred music. Volume two had secular music in it, um, collected by Jonathan Shipley Kopp. And the spacing of this page um, mirrors some of the conventions that we see in printed sheet music in, the t in, the, in its day. So in books like these, the degree to which human presence is detectable on the page of music varies. Um, in chirography, the copyist's hand becomes metonymic. That is, the physical hand and the penmanship hand bear the same name of hand. Um, and this contrasts, uh, importantly, with print, and especially with typography, which really absents or abstracts the body. Only in mistakes do we notice that the printer's body was present. And in general, the relationship between the body is rendered more metaphorical with print, thanks to terminology used for the technology itself. So in typography, they refer to the body of the type. Manuscript, on the other hand, foregrounds the copyist's physical self. You can sense the intimacy of the hand moving across the page. It's clearly evident in the quirks and the care displayed in, by all kinds of handwriting. This is one of my favorite manuscripts because John Gaylord Jr., a, a lawyer, um, he would annotate his manuscript book and, and call himself out for the mistakes that he made. So on this page, he says, it appears that the first strain of this tune is barred wrong. And he kind of goes on to explain like how he made this mistake in copying and um, says, he tells the, his reader or himself where they can refer to to find the correct version. Um, Manuscript also provides a sense of temporality, that is, it exposes the order of the steps in which copying proceeded. Similar to designing a pattern before sewing, paper pages had to be laid out carefully lest the copyist waste valuable space through miscalculation, which is precisely what we see Lucy Sheldon doing here. She didn't line the right number of staves and uh, has an odd number so she can't enter the treble and bass part to the song, the popular song, The Silver Moon. So she stops, she stops copying. She doesn't copy the base part when she realizes her mistake. Um, if the pages were blank to begin with, uh, the copyist first had to line them, drawing out straight and even staves. And those with the means uh, could purchase specialized musical tools to do this kind of work. There was a music ruling pen or rastrum that would make the work go much faster. But mastering the use of that tool took some practice which we see here with Elizabeth Todd's uh, book. This, she, she had one of these rastra, rastrums, but she um, uh, had to experiment with it on the front cover and inside cover, where you can see this cross-hatched thicket of staff lines, and there's like ink spilling between the lines. Very um, understandably, she decides to start to write collection of music on uh, using this rastrum. You can really see her getting used to the new uh, tool in a sort of playful, playful way. When women and men set the quill or the pen to the paper, they uh, proceeded to transform this blank sheet into a space of thought and of sound. Moving the nib across the page, their minute bodily gestures engineered a kind of conversion. What had been empty visual space become one that facilitated or even encouraged performance. One might take this for granted because well-copied music yields itself to its function as a score that can be read or just looked at. But the power of this transformation comes across really clearly when there's evidence that it was thwarted or forsaken, um, uh, such as scraps of notation and unfinished entries that could not be realized into a performance. So here's an example of that. This is the back cover of a manuscript uh, book copied and made by two siblings, the Wadsworth siblings, um, who I write about in the book. And this is just sort of a chaotic hodgepodge where they experiment on the back cover. But you can see in the, lo the lowest line that someone did start to write music, but it's not really, it doesn't take on this, uh, the, the st status of performable music. They give up on it, which reminds us of just how uh, contingent these, these activities were. Liberated, um, so when, when liberated from the need for any kind of recognizable sy musical syntax, these amateurs doodles and uh, really contrast with the legibility of copied pieces. 
I like to think that when wielding a pen, amateurs didn't necessarily create scores from which they, they didn't necessarily want to create scores from which they could perform. Um, sometimes they just wanted to play around. Um, but, uh, but when they did, it was because they had successfully reproduced existing musical works. So they weren't composing, um, they were copying. And in doing so, they were transferring the creative effort of a different time and place and a different person into their own. They were doing this importation. So on the one hand, successfully copying was what was defined by the accuracy of their endeavors. But on, on the other hand, through copying, amateurs were able to really exceed their exemplars' contents, especially when doodling humorous cartoons and random notes, which is an imaginative activity that had little to do with musical performance and everything to do with making a visually stimulating book. So copying music wasn't simply copying, it really was conjuring a new site or a new location for making music. And with that in mind, I want to turn to one of the amateurs who I write about in the book and uh, listen to one of the pieces that she copied. Um, I don't have an image of Catherine Ackerley Mitchell, um, but I do know quite a bit a lot about her. Um, her manuscript music book is at the AAS. It's one of the first ones I looked at. And her papers, her, some of her letters are at the Library of Congress, which I've looked at as well. She also was married to a congressman, so that helps document her sort of life and experiences in the world. But Catherine Ackerley, she grew up on Long Island and was the daughter of a shipbuilder, um, born in 1778, so weathered the revolution on Long Island, which uh, was difficult. Um, uh, and in 1792, her family sent her to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, where she attended the Moravian Seminary for Girls, uh, which was a prestigious and rigorous school. Moravians, uh, a pietist religious sect, uh, provided this, uh, believed in providing the same education to boys and to girls, so they were very unusual in their day. Um, they also had a greater than typical focus on music in their life. Um, and. Uh, so it's completely in keeping with their sort of music theology that they would have um, a great deal of music education available to pupils at their school, even pupils who weren't themselves Moravian. At the school, Catherine began to copy music into her manuscript book. There's only one of her books that um, survives. I don't know if she did any others. Um, as was typical, uh, lots of pupils there copied music into books and also took music lessons. Um, the seminary itself had a good music library, and she also may have accessed music from Philadelphia, which was um, relatively nearby. She left the school when she was 16, which was not unusual, and she got married um, and lived in New York City, uh, where she continued to copy music, I believe, because some of the music in her book um, clearly seems to have been copied from sheet music printed and sold in the city. Um, her first husband died, I don't know much about him, um, and then she married Samuel Latham Mitchell, who was a doctor at Columbia and um, also became a Republican congressman. In the early 19th century, she went with him to Washington when he was uh, serving as a congressman, and while she was there, she circulated in quite elite political circles. Um, she met Thomas Jefferson when he was president and wrote about the mortifying experience she had when she met him and she stepped on his foot, which would be embarrassing for anybody, but was especially embarrassing um, uh, for her. She, she felt it very keenly as she wrote to her, her sister. Um, but she also got to know the sort of social elite there, like Dolly Madison, whom she admired for her social grace, uh, while always kind of not taking uh, the she writes to her sister about not being so impressed by all of this decorous political social life that she encountered in Washington. She seems to have disengaged herself from making music herself at, by this time. She doesn't write or uh, seem to discuss copying music or playing music, but she does write approvingly and admiringly of women uh, in Washington who entertained with music in their homes. So her manuscript book this seems to represent really her early life. Um, and that's sort of how I take it. So I imagine this is what music meant to her when she was, um, before she was married and maybe when she was recently married to her first husband. Into this book, she copied a slew of uh, piano music and also sentimental secular songs. And I would say the music she copied is slightly more technically challenging than I typically find in amateur's collections. I attribute this to the superior music education she received at the Moravian Seminary, 
but all of those sentimental songs she copied are completely typical of what I find um, was preferred by her and among by her peers. So the repertoire and style of these uh, sentimental songs in her music book are overwhelmingly British. Um, in this era, white Americans like Catherine Ackerley, who wished to appeal, appear genteel and cosmopolitan, followed the musical trends of Britain, chiefly the commercial successful popular music that was heard in pleasure gardens and on the English uh, 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 urban opera stages. Um, all of this music was in English and it featured simple, tuneful melodies and very easy accompaniments. Um, songs were strophic, that is, they consisted of several verses to the same music, and the topics of the song's lyrics were very uh, predictable. They were almost always about romance and about pastoral themes and about sort of nostalgia and fantasy, uh, uh, sort of social fantasy. Um, there was considerable bias against this repertoire. Uh, critics considered it to be trite and even called it morally questionable. Um, this is very similar to how the novel was viewed in this era. Um, but what I find noteworthy is just how agreeable this repertoire would have been to an amateur. It's very pleasing, it's easy to play and accessible. And although it was criticized for being sentimental, I think that emotional content was also part of its draw. So for example, uh, the stylistic and lyrical traits that amateurs like Catherine Ackerley preferred can be found in this song, Queen Mary's Lamentation. The song appeared frequently in print and uh, Catherine copied it, others copied it as well. It was written by an English poet and composer, Anne Hunter, but it was in its day ascribed and is still commonly ascribed to another composer. Um, the song's topic is the lamentation of Queen Mary of Scots, um, uh, the Catholic cousin of Queen Elizabeth, whose imprisonment and execution captivated writers for centuries, uh, still does, and it tapped into, uh, in the 18th century, a broader interest in all things Scottish that coincided with a general nostalgia for a romanticized pastoral past. So Mary, who by the 18th century had emerged as a sympathetic figure, despite her plots against Queen Elizabeth, is depicted as a tragic heroine rather than as a savvy player of uh, cutthroat games of court politics. The musical style of Queen Mary's Lamentation supported a sentimental depiction of Mary, emphasizing her stoicism and her helplessness. It's in a slow triple meter. It's marked Largo or slow in Ackerley's manuscript. And the tune features Scottish style snap rhythms like bada, 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 that's the rhythm, uh, and an expressive appoggiatura figure lending interest to an otherwise pretty plain tune. The melody serves as a nice vehicle for the lyrics display of emotional and perceptual sensitivity. The song is as simple harmonically as it is melodically and is uh, in the first person, the singer impersonating Queen Mary uh, begins by singing, I sigh and lament me in vain, these walls but echo my moan. Comparing her imprisonment to the freedom of the birds she sees through the prison grate, she describes her yearning for liberty and the toll her imprisonment has taken. She says, my looks are wild with despair. After condemning her foes and predicting the future redemption of her reputation, the song closes with a gothic turn, a dire description of the dismal prison, cold and damp, with owls who from battlements cry into the hollow winds that makes her blood run cold. So Catherine Ackerley copied this book carefully into her manuscript, as we can see over the course of two pages. Um, she wrote out all of the verses and we can listen to it. Um, uh, here, uh, I'm going to trust that the audio is going to work fine. Kevin, just let me know if it isn't. That was Juliana Baird singing. So this song and the many, uh, like, uh, the many others like it that amateurs copied is pleasingly predictable, especially when you listen to the entire song and hear the multiple stanzas. Fans of this style could expect technically manageable, musically frictionless, emotionally resonant songs. The reasons this repertoire was criticized for being frivolous and being overly emotional were part of its appeal to amateurs. This repertoire helped American amateurs cultivate and engender sensibility in themselves and others through performance. 
Queen Mary's overwrought lamentation, which juxtaposes, uh, is almost dissonant with the cheerful, light, repetitive music, offered women like Catherine Ackerley an outlet for self-expression that was desirable because of its sentimentality, its British pedigree, and its predictability. That said, there were not many other options. Besides Protestant sacred music, this was the repertoire that was widely available and was foisted upon genteel uh, consumers. So Ackerley and her peers made use of the materials that built them. So um, by way of just a conclusion, as I was finishing my book, um, I was uh, finishing the edits on it, my sister sent me a manuscript book I myself had copied as a girl. Um, I'd completely forgotten I'd done this, um, but holding it in my hands and looking through page after page of my careful handwriting, it dawned on me how this project has always been personal. This is a book about amateur musicians, many of whom were young women in their teens and 20s, who pursued music as a meaningful creative outlet and as a mode of identity formation, and whose dedication to making music extended to copying repertoire out by hand. As a young woman, I had done the same. Manuscript books had always looked to me, when I started since I started researching, they'd always looked to me like 18th century versions of the mixtapes my friends and I had made. And amateurs' accounts of dutifully practicing and taking lessons reminded me of the countless hours I had spent doing the same. At my peak, I developed the sensation that my instrument was like an extension of my body, and making music like others could feel like a pleasurable form of wordless communication, or when it wasn't going well, it was very alienating. And I began to wonder if the people I was investigating had similar experiences. I also recognized how I, as a white woman of relative privilege who takes pleasure from music, bear a superficial similarity to many of the amateurs I write about. But none of those terms, woman, white, privilege, pleasure, music, none of those mean today uh, what they meant in the 18th century. So I don't take the comparison too far. Because these amateurs aren't actually distant mirrors uh, to music lovers today, Rather, their interests and their work, that is the corpus of manuscript books they left behind, show how important making music was in, fashioning, in the fashioning of the world they inhabited. So with that, I will close. Thank you. And we'll stop screen sharing. All right. Thank you, Glenda. Um, uh, so as uh, att attendees continue to submit questions, the Q&A uh, feature is open. We have a few coming in now, which I will get to in a moment. Uh, but please uh, keep adding them and, and voting them up as, you, as you'd like. Um, first, I kind of like to start things off, Glenda. Um, absolutely uh, love the book. And the, the preface, I think, is, was in particular, something that really caught my eye because you really, you know, balance this, uh, you balance the, the, you know, very, uh, you know, uh, academic uh, methodological features of, you know, how you go about, you know, writing this book, but simultaneously you kind of acknowledge the fact that, uh, you know, it's difficult to be objective in the archives because mm -hmm. um, I want to actually get the, the line right. You know, you, you say that you know, working in the archives spurs the imagination and pulls the heartstrings. One comes to know a certain copy of a book. I love that. And I think we all kind of, uh, those of us who have spent a lot of time in the archives, uh, you know, I think feel the same way. Um, kind of actually curious though about your role as both a musician and a historian, uh, because I, I'm wondering how each of those roles kind of influence the other when you approach a new item. So when you're in the reading room, you know, do you look at this item first as a musician and then a, a, a historian? Uh, you know, you're reading, you're reading a document or a, an item on so many different levels here. How does, how does that work for you? Because you kind of unpack your, your process in the archives a little bit. Um, yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, the preface is my favorite part of the book. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't know how to approach these 
uh, materials in any other way than I approach them. So I don't actually experience it as separating out historian from musician. Um, what I have found is that communicating about these materials does require me to think very seriously about those different roles and the different audiences, because what I take for granted isn't taken for granted by other people. Um, when I talk to musicians about the gendering of music, and I think, you know, anyone who's familiar with 18th century, 19th century gender norms can imagine how a performative behavior like making music would be gendered. Um, it's not always available to musicians to think about it, musicians today to think about it that way. They might think about, well, were they women composers? Um, so it's, there's sort of a, a translation that I seek to do to make these ideas legible to different audiences. Similarly, um, there was no question in my mind that this represented a really intriguing musical practice that would absolutely have uh, had an impact on the cultural history of early America, especially given how much British stuff there was in these books after the revolution. Um, but I had to learn how to communicate how to historians how music can have some sort of social efficacy without making a direct causal link. Like it's not that because these songs were copied, something external changed that you could track over time, but you can still sense the influence. And especially since it's an influence that um, tends to be overlooked because these are amateurs, uh, uh, it's important to, it was important for me to learn how to tease those out. So I, would, I wouldn't say that I, I sort of put on one hat or put on another hat when I'm in the archive, um, but I do try to think really carefully about those different roles when I'm communicating about these materials because anyone who's spent time in an archive and enjoys spending time in an archive knows that like there's nothing better than just collecting materials and reading them and getting more and learning about more and talking to people about them. It's, it's what I write about in the preface as the kind of archive fever uh, bear, uh, borrowing from Derrida but the real trick is then to tell other people about them and make other people care about them as much as you do. And so that's what I, uh, that's, that's really where I think about my different roles as musician and historian and really um, being respectful to both of those positions. Yeah, thank you. Um, while I, I'm getting together the next question, I know one of the Q&A questions asked to actually go back and see those, yeah. those early slides. So if it's possible, if you take a moment, I would love to show those. And I want to thank everybody, uh, and especially you, Glenda. Thank you for your patience with that. <laughs> we're, all, we're all catching up and, and learning the technology, so. I know, we are all learning. Um, patience is the name of the game. So I'm going to share it without playing it, so in case it was the playing of the slideshow that was the problem. Um, this is the Betsy Gaylord tune book that I started with. This is the one, the first one that I saw at the AAS. You can tell that these are 10 year old pictures because they are terrible. Um, cameras have improved, um, but you can see uh, these are the examples from her book. And then I showed a series of images from my various archival trips. Um, this is an anonymous book from Old Sturbridge Village uh, that was hand bound in newspaper and then um, had various um, poems and texts and also music written into it. You can see the ink bleeding through. Here's another one from Old Sturbridge Village that has some of the best doodles in it. Um, this is one from the Connecticut Historical Society. I almost, I almost made Cushing Ills a, a character in this book, but decided not to. He was a, a successful lawyer in, in Connecticut. Um, and then this is a book by one of the main people I write about in the book, Sally Brown Hershoff uh, from the Rhode Island Historical Society. She had a huge library of a huge collection of music. And she, um, this one I included because she identifies it as her favorite. This is her, uh, as you can see on the upper right, it says SB's favorite song. Um, this gives a sense of the range of styles and also ability. If you compare Sally Brown's handwriting to the handwriting of this anonymous person, um, you can really see there's a, a, a whole spectrum of, of um, ability represented in this corpus. Great, thank you for that. Um, I, I have a couple of other questions, but I do uh, see that there's a lot of questions building all of a sudden. So I wanted to just kind of jump right into uh, Susan Branson's question here. Uh, and the question is, um, are hand copied music books similar to commonplace books? Were they shared? Uh, were they added by acquaintances? 
So they bear a lot of similarities to commonplace books and to the practice of commonplacing where you collect various materials over the course of time, materials that might be useful to oneself as part of, as I'm sure many of you know, as part of this humanistic education system. Um, I ended up not thinking of these quite as commonplace books because they don't bear some of the bookish traits of commonplace books, the kind of indexing and keeping track of materials that you would find in a, in a good commonplace book. But in terms of their social function, I think they, they can be similar. Um, I find plenty of bibliographical evidence within the books themselves that show that they were shared. Anything from multiple hands being a Writing in a book, which is document even that Wadsworth manuscript I showed a picture of, um, to actual inscriptions saying like I'm giving my book to you. Um, uh, but I, I thought a lot about about that kind of terminology and what would make sense. But ultimately, I think the term commonplacing is good for understanding the practice, but not so much what they are as objects. Which is why I ended up just calling them books. Also, the the amateurs themselves more often than not just label the books my book or my music book. Uh, and there's a directness to that that I want it to be um, truthful to. Thank you. Uh, next question kind of jumps right into um, uh, the experiences of self-recrimination uh, to which uh, these pages testify. This is from Amy <laughs> Schwartz. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the relationship between shame and cultivation? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, one of the most pleasurable parts of this book to write was when I write about humiliation and mu making music. Any musician knows that playing music can be incredibly, incredibly humiliating. Um, as a violist, I used to feel like playing out of tune was physically humiliating. Um, and uh, I find that the pages of these really testify to the frustration that went along with having to have like a, a, a completely um, polished present self presentation. Um, I, I have numerous examples of this. I think the John Gaylord one is the most um, uh, self flagellating where he writes, Oh, he constantly says I did this wrong. Um, but more often what you find is just people giving up which I think also speaks to the amount of labor that um, people who persisted uh, had, like were willing to invest in this. Anyone who has also done handwork knows that when you realize that you've done an entire row of stitches wrong, it's like, you know, it's a physical experience of disappointment and alarm that takes over. Um, uh, and I, I think that putting this kind of musical practice in a broader context of, um, trial and error was really important. It also played into 18th century senses of embodied civility and what bodies were supposed to do and not supposed to do, of course. Um, we have another question here um, asking, was there any overlap in lyrics, melodies, or audiences with the cheap lyrics only broadside ballads? <sighs> Nothing substantial that I've, nothing substantial enough to make me take note of it. Um, those broadside ballads that were, you know, extremely timely and responsive to current events played such an important role in early modern political and social and cultural life, clearly. Um, sometimes there was a transfer of songs that were popular on broadside ballads that then made the jump into these other more durable formats like manuscript books. And in fact, some political songs in early America do that. I can't believe it took me this long to remember. Um, I wrote a whole article about the song God Save the King, which made this jump from more ephemeral formats like broadsides into manuscript books and printed music book collections. But it's, it's, it's rare. It doesn't happen very often. They, they really speak to distinct um, uh, ways of consuming music and sometimes even distinct um, people, distinct social groups. Thank you. And for those who are interested, uh, I, in the chat function there, I actually added a link to uh, the American Antiquarian Society's Isaiah Thomas's collection of broadside ballads. So if you're interested in that, you can go check out that website as well. Um, there's a lot of uh, kind of multimodal sound elements and the like. Um, so. Just a little side <laughs> side link there. It's a wonderful um, website. Thank you. Um, 
actually, D uh, Damien Fleming and I have a, a very similar question here. Um, I think my ears perked up at the end there when you were talking about yourself and the the uh, the mixtapes, and I went, "Oh, I, you know, <laughs> this takes me back." Yeah. Um, but uh, Damien's question here, very similar to mine: uh, Do you find amateur copyists modifying or adding to the music they copy? So, are they actually kind of serving as kind of you know DJs or or uh, remixers themselves? <laughs> Only to make it easier. Um... It's, it's hard to modify music and make it and, and in such a way that it will sound even decent, not let alone better or good. Um, so sometimes amateurs will simplify accompaniment or they will be, I don't always know, maybe they're copying from a copy that's already simplified. But that's the one thing I see people doing, making things easier to perform. Um, yeah, I, I looked, I looked to see if there was in creative inventiveness happening, a sort of like talking back to the composer, but really, no, this was, this was far more straightforward. Mm. Um, I'm actually reading the next question here. And this is, you know, one, there's so many interesting things that we find in our research that we just couldn't quite fit into this project. Um, we have a question here. Was there anything really interesting that, that you found that just didn't make the final cut. What were you unable to include in this book? Uh, <laughs> it's an unfair I did, question. <laughs> I did have to force myself to stop writing it. Um, that was hard, as many people have, uh, can relate to with the first books. Um, so I, I confess there are things that I can't remember if they ended up in the book or not, actually. I, but I did have a whole thing. I actually, I write more about printed music in the book than I, than I talked about today because a lot of these amateurs also collected printed music. And I, do, I got really interested in the early American music print trade, which leads directly to Isaiah Thomas of the AAS um, because he uh, was a major publisher of music. Um, so I had this whole thing in the book about how the particular case of, uh, of, of music type that he used, the whole set of music type that he used, was then given to one of his apprentices, Andrew Wright, who moved to Northampton, Massachusetts. And you can track, um, so sort of bibliographically, you can track these, this, these type font, you know, these pieces of type, you can see them from one uh, publication to another. And I had this whole sort of thing about how, as the font is, as the set of type moves west into land that is incredibly contested uh, because uh, Anglo settler colonists are pushing back um, the native groups whose ancestral homelands it is. Um, you can see this sort of like breakdown of this mode of civility and cosmopolitanism that comes with printed music as it moves into these contested uh, terrains. And I don't think I ended up putting that in the book, but I really, I gave a lot of papers about it and I really like it. And I keep thinking about that. Like what happened, and this sort of bulky unwieldiness of like, why would you move like a printing, I mean, why would you move a printing press with to print music type for the community there? But they did it, Andrew Wright did it because there was a singing society, a homosocial all male singing society there. So it really speaks to how valuable this these kinds of musical practices were for advancing this idea of like cultivation and, um, and gentility, even on the so-called frontier. That didn't make it into the book, um, but maybe it'll make it somewhere eventually. I think, I think we have time for a couple more here. Um, well, things keep moving on me here. Um, so here's a question. Um, what do you make of the parallel between 18th century musical uh, aficionados dismissing the music of the masses for being too sappy and the music critics today dismissing popular music? Is there a parallel? I think there's a clear parallel. Um, and I think there's a parallel when you look at the position that those critics are trying to protect by that elitist behavior in both time periods. Um, you know, I think that in both time periods, you have critics who are invested in protecting a particular version of what is good music. And they do so out of a, you know, often what we now are calling in, in musicology, we actually label it, we identify it as white supremacy because it is identifying a certain kind of music that is 
European um, uh, or, uh, and, and is viewed as being like complicated and related to an individual composer who's a genius, all of that bear the hallmarks that scholars are recognizing and, and activists are recognizing as part of white supremacy. So when critics are saying that, they're really saying that they prefer not to be confronted with music that doesn't uphold those values. So that's one thing, that's a pretty heavy thing. But another thing is that there's a, a, a willingness on the part of music fans to just take pleasure in music um, that I think is uh, somehow is continually hard for some critics to access. That sometimes it's okay just to enjoy something because it's enjoyable. And that part of the enjoyment has to do with the context in which you're taking it in. So a sappy song that you listen to with your first, you know, boyfriend or girlfriend or, or love interest, mean, it doesn't need to be the best song meaningful. I think that those kinds of broader contexts really should inform how we make sense of uh, repertoire. Hmm. Related, related to that, again, thinking about parallels between the 18th century and today, um, there's this term amateur as well that comes up. And I, I, you know, a lot of you know, you know cultural criticisms and uh, you know cultural histories have, have been kind of like looking at this this definition of of the amateur. And I'm wondering, you know, when we think of the word amateur today, I think there's you know two clear things that come to mind. One is this idea that uh, you're just inept, you're you're not good at this thing. It's very amateurish, right? Um, the other might just simply mean uh, you don't get paid for this work. Um, and I, I think maybe there's a third element here as well. And I think this is one of those themes that comes up in your book a lot, whether, you know, the amateur that you're, the, the character you're speaking of is, you know, incredibly good at this craft, or maybe, you know, as, as we saw with, uh, you know, the, the rastrum practice, um, uh, you know, still kind of figuring out our way. Um, uh, but, you know, the, the third option here is that the, you know, the word amateur, uh, you know, the root of the word amateur simply means to love. So you, you love the thing that you're doing, um, whether you're good at it or not, or getting paid for it or not. Um, I guess my question is, is what does the term amateur mean in the 18th and early 19th century? Um, and how did you kind of define that term or how did you kind of select these characters based on that definition? Hmm. Right. I mean, alternate terms that would have been more recognizable to the people in the time period I write about would be maybe um, connoisseur or aficionado or dilettante. And actually, each of those terms like dilettante was gendered, that men were dilettantes. Men were the wealthy people who could sort of invest their leisure time in pursuing hobbies. Um, and for women, the term that was applied was the idea of accomplishments. Is she accomplished or not? Can she play music? Can she paint? Can she embroider, et cetera? So amateur actually wasn't so much the term that people in the time used. It's a term I actually decided to retroactively apply. And when it does come up, it doesn't have a pejorative connotation in this time period. It doesn't, hasn't yet gathered that baggage. Um, I decided to use the term because it helped me distinguish between occupational musicians and non-occupational musicians. Um, and I, I like that framing of occupation and non-occupation, which I, I take from Candace Bailey's work on, uh, because it puts the focus on the fact that profession, you know, pro people who do things professionally might still do it without a lot of experience, or people who are doing things professionally continually are moving through spaces and experiences where they where they have not yet had a lot of experience, such as giving a book talk over Zoom. Um, so you can still be professional, but do something that you're not particularly good at yet. Um, but amateur was a way, uh, was a term that helped me gather together these group of people to recognize that they, some of them were very good. You know, they were very good at music. Some of them were not, um, but they all pursued this non-occupationally. And the choice of the word amateur instead of non-occupational musician, one, it's, it's less clunky, but another is that I wanted to, um, as I'm sure is clear from hearing me talk about it, I wanted to give credence and credibility to this as a valid form of music making that music historians should take seriously, um, as opposed to professionals or composers or virtuosic performers, et cetera. Mm. That's terrific, thank you. Um, I think we have time for one last question. Um, I think the next on the list that's been unanswered is from 
from Lance Booz. Uh, and he asks, uh, have you seen many instances of people adding manuscript music to the margins or reverse sides of published music? Not to the margins. Um, the published music I've seen doesn't tend to have margins large enough to make that um, practical. Um, yes, on the reverse side, yes. People use, paper was expensive, people used it. Um, and I also have a lot of examples of people tipping in music into various kinds of books or pinning it, you know, like with, a, with an actual pin um, into the book or a nail into the book. So there's all kinds of interesting hybrid manuscript print volumes that show that people were incredibly creative in how they um, made these materials, which actually speaks to Damien's question about, you know, people messing with the music. They don't change the text of the music, but they certainly do very interesting things with how it appears. I highlighted today how they emulated print, but there's lots of other kinds of experimentation that also happened. That's wonderful. All right, well, with that, um, I'd like to thank Glenda Goodman for joining us today. Um, there are many, many questions we did not get to. Um, Glenda, I don't know how you feel about this, but I am happy to collect these questions uh, and uh, forward them on to you if you'd like to follow up with individuals later. Um, I might ask those who didn't get questions uh, answered, just email me um, directly. I will put that in the chat um, and we'll see what we can do. Um, I would, yes, I'd be happy to answer questions. Um, I'm, I'm contactable through, you know, the internet. Well, we can go directly to Glenda. Yeah, <laughs> that's terrific. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Glenda. And uh, thank, uh, I want to thank each of you for attending. Um, our next book talk will feature Jonathan Senshin, who will discuss his book, uh, The Intimacy of Paper in Early and 19th Century American Literature. Um, remember to check out all of our future AAS programs. Uh, and again, you can sign up to our mailing list. Um, you will receive a follow-up email from me soon. So one more time, uh, thank you, Glenda. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kevin. Okay. Next time, see you soon.